Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, county commissioners, library board members. Thank you very much for coming this evening. We're here to talk about the future of our libraries and our current finances and the library systems. We have uh, collected a, an esteemed panel here today that specifically have knowledge about how libraries are funded, have an intimate knowledge in terms of how libraries are funded not only in the state of Pennsylvania, but also nationally. This is part of a three series community panel discussion. Our first panel discussion was on the needs of our community. The second panel discussion was on the future of the library. So we had futurists come in and tell us, give us a little crystal ball in terms of what we can expect in the future. And this panel discussion, again, is focused on the finances of libraries. After these panel discussions, the library directors, the library boards, uh, the, the county clerk, Larry Thomas, uh, and myself will be getting together and doing some visioning meetings and coming up with what we believe is a solid vision for the future. And from that, we'll be sharing that vision with the county commissioners as well as the library board at the same time. And from that discussion and from that sharing, we will then have consensus building meetings with the commissioners. So stay tuned for those. We'll be letting you know when those happen. It's probably going to be in the July, August time frame. So I'm going to express the actual purpose of the session. In light of the rapidly changing technology and user preferences, we want to understand A, the options available to libraries for funding, B, look at CCLS's current funding model in relation to other approaches, and C, look at the relationship between a library service model and a sustainable funding strategy for the future. Our agenda is sixfold. We've done the welcome already. Woohoo! Done. We'll <laughs> talk about the discussion uh, format in just a moment. We're going to do brief introductions of the panelists and, and our special guests here. And then we're going to have some opening remarks. As a part of our opening remarks, uh, Larry Thomas will share uh, with us the view, his view of, of how these panel dis discussions fit together in the big picture. And we'll have Janelle Dar share the finances for the Cumberland County Library System so that everybody has context as we start having the conversations with the panelists. So just so that you know, all of the panelists have received the financial data that you have in front of you. So if you do not have a handout, let us know. We want to make sure you have that because it's going to be very important as, the, as each of the panelists and as Janelle is going through the numbers with you. So we don't want to bore you with numbers tonight, but we do definitely want to give you context so that as these discussions go forward, you have a good understanding as to what decision points we have to make as a community. We will then have the questions for the panelists. We have uh, developed six questions that uh, we feel are pretty comprehensive that meet the purpose. And these esteemed panelists will help us to kind of navigate through and understand as a community what, this fi what finances look like for library systems. And of course, we'll have a brief summary. All right, the format for tonight is I'm the moderator, Monica Gould. And I will be the one who asks the panelists the, the, the questions. We've actually directed the question to certain panelists. Everyone will have an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, but we have uh, scheduled a pretty nice program for you tonight. Then after the panelists have answered the questions, we will then have the opportunity for the commissioners as well as the library board members to ask specific questions to the panelists. After that, we will then have an opportunity for the audience members to submit questions on a three by five card, if you could. Uh, and then you bring them up, one of our volunteers will bring them up to me and then I'll read those off and uh, we'll hopefully get some great answers from these guys. <coughs> Ground rules, pretty simple. Let's respect one another. We might have different views, but we're all here to learn uh, about the future of our community and the future of our library system. So we ask that we allow the speakers to uh, present their concepts and uh, allow them to finish their, their dialogue and then we'll have the opportunity for questions and answers at the end. We all agree to that? Yes? yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so as I said, I'm Monica Gould. I'm moderating tonight and I'm gonna ask the commissioners to kind of uh, turn around and wave their hand as I announce you. Barbara Cross, 
Barbara is our, our chair. Uh, Commissioner Jim Hertzler. Thank you, Commissioner. Gary Eichelberger. And then Larry Thomas, our chief clerk. Hey, Larry. All right, and then we also have our um, library system board here. So, Dr. Gould. No relation to me, by the way. He just has an awesome name. Okay. Kevin Stoner. Hi, Kevin. Paul Fisher. Jane Graham. There you are, Jane. Uh, Jim Hutchinson. Hi, Jim. Sue Simmons. Elizabeth Stone. There's Elizabeth. And Jonelle, who's the executive director of the Cumberland County Library System. So um, in your handouts, you actually have a full biography of each of the panelists. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of flash up their picture, tell you um, who they are, kind of give you a, a high-level overview, and then you can read details about each of these esteemed panelists tonight. So Glenn Miller is the executive director of the Pennsylvania Library Association. Uh, Glenn is everything libraries in the state of Pennsylvania. He's been doing this for quite some time and has a plethora of knowledge that he's going to be sharing with us tonight. I won't say how long you've been there, but it's in there. Okay, then we've got Karen Collins, Community Relations Director of Dolphin County Library System. Uh, we, we thought Karen would, was a great choice because she has a perspective from a neighboring library system and can really share some things that, that Dolphin County is doing. And we have Deborah Fulham Winston. Hi, Deborah. Thank you so much for coming. She is the Asset Development Associate for the for TFAC, if you know what TFAC is. It's the Foundation for Enhancing Communities. She is a fundraising professional. This is what she's done her whole career. So she knows how to fundraise. She understands the principles of fundraising, grant writing. So I think she can bring a lot of information and expertise to us in regard to how we actually can receive funds outside of our uh, public systems. And then we have Dr. Stone. Dr. Stone is from the Franklin Group. He's the principal there. He, you may know, uh, some of you may know him. He was involved in the Bosler Capital Campaign to help to build the new library. So he is a, um, I guess you're serving, what, what's the other community that you're helping to fundraise for Adam, right now? Adams County. Adams County Library. So he's intimately familiar with capital campaigns uh, in relationship to library systems. So on that note, I'm going to let Larry come up and share your opening remarks. Larry, please. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Um, I think uh, the, the memo went out yesterday to wear uh, money green. And uh, as you see, Janelle, my counterpart for the library system, <laughs> is in a very vibrant, expansive green outfit, whereas I am in the more subdued, darker green motif. You may infer what you like from that. Um, at the second session of our series on the future of libraries, my remarks focused on choices. They were based on the premise that libraries are not free and cannot be all things to all people given that funding is finite and highly competitive. Planning for the future will require choices, both by those providing library services, as well as the communities funding those services. Tonight, I would like to discuss briefly uh, leadership and vision. For what is leadership, if not the ability to face up to difficult choices, to assess options, remediate conflicting agendas, and mobilizes the resources needed for a community to prevail and prosper. And what is vision, save for the willingness to resist the temptation of business as usual? And see how new combinations of assets and prudent investment can result in a greater collective benefit than previously imagined. How our old skin can be shed to reveal the butterfly within. I have heard well-intentioned people state that the desired outcome of our dialogue should be an immediate increase in the library tax. On the funding side, I have heard people say that funding the libraries is their own problem and that libraries should simply learn to live within the means provided by our current funding model. 
these don't strike me as being particularly leadership oriented, at least from my own personal uh, perspective. It seems a little bit more like denial. And I'm not talking about the river in Egypt. Denial of the need to make choices. Denial of the complexity and the expense of the challenges our libraries face. Denial of the need to plan for and manage change for a strategic community resource. On the one hand, a fantasy predicated on the false assumption that the structural problems of business as usual, i.e. an ever-expanding service model without clear priorities and a well-developed strategic vision that has overextended its current funding model can somehow be patched up with continuous infusions of short-term funding as the foundation crumbles around the enterprise. Here's a little Old Testament for you. On the other hand, an unwillingness to grasp both the benefit that a more strategically focused library system than we currently have can provide our community and the extent of the challenge that even a more focused and forward-thinking library system faces to be financially sustainable. It's a classic instance of kicking the can down the road on both sides. It's a view that will lead our libraries, unfortunately, into crisis. I am drawn to a statement from the Aspen Institute, who was one of our presenters at the last uh, session. Uh, and uh, that quotation is as follows. Perhaps the greatest challenge facing public libraries today is to transform their service model to meet the demands of the knowledge society while securing a sustainable funding base for the future. End of quote. This cogently underscores the interdependence of scope and funding. Funding can't be addressed in isolation from scope and cost. We have here tonight, once again, some of the best minds in this field to advise and inform us on funding approaches for our libraries. And as far as I know, though, they are not magicians. Is, is that correct? Correct. 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 All right. <laughs> Ultimately, leadership must come from within our community. Leadership that is willing to make choices, plan for the future, and remediate competing agendas for the good of our community. The value of tonight's session, of this entire series, ultimately depends on whether the community's leaders on both the service and funding sides use this information to address the following very real questions that will at least in part determine whether our libraries remain healthy, vibrant, and viable <coughs> for years to come. Number one, based on the intersection of unmet community needs and realistic library capabilities, what is an appropriate scope or service model for our libraries and how much does that cost? Number two, where should funding come from to support an appropriate scope or service model for our libraries? Number three, is our county's current funding model viable to support an appropriate scope for libraries? We're almost, almost done, it doesn't go on to 12. But number four, how should libraries approach capital needs, which will be significant given the cost of the network infrastructure needed to support the library of the future that we heard about in great detail uh, and, and in a very encouraging way in our last session. Fifth is how can libraries sustain themselves financially long term given the rate and extent of change in technology and user preferences. And finally, how can our own Cumberland County library system uh, funding formula be repaired in order to reverse the trend in part that has created halves and have-nots within our very own library system so that those library services that are most needed can remain available to those who need them the most. Leadership and vision. Tough to argue with, sounds easy, but much harder to actually do. The challenges outlined in our first two sessions don't have an easy fix. A tax increase won't make them disappear. It is time to set, step up to the plate, to make choices, to look to the future, to stop looking at what we've done in the past to say cut costs marginally, 
and instead tackle the question of sustainable financing for a new library system that may wind up providing services in large part that we aren't even providing now. To shine the bright, unflattering white light of critical reason on business as usual. To identify silos that result in the waste at the expense of unmet needs. To get past the smug complacency that places local provincial interests in control over the potential to create the best possible library system for the entire county. To let all of our residents ride the great information highway rather than just those who can afford to live in resource-rich communities. To join forces and resources on both sides of the debate as a community to define a viable service model and provide the funding to sustain our libraries long term. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Larry stole my joke about my green suit. Um, but I, I forgive you, Larry. The purpose of my comments tonight are really to provide context for what our panelists are going to be talking about a little bit later on. And the basic questions that I was given initially um, are listed here. And I'm not going to read them to you. We're going to cover this information in the coming slides. This particular slide, I hope, makes you gasp. That's the intention of this slide. This slide, everybody that I've showed it to said, wow. Well, welcome to a little mind map of a little piece of my brain. There's a lot of good, as Larry Thomas said to me earlier this week, there's a lot of good information here, but man, is this busy. I encourage you all to take it home, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll provide a little bit of clarity tonight as we move through the later slides. But I just wanted to point out, up there we have the county library tax. And over here we have state <coughs> revenue sources that come through the library system, which is right here. We get a tiny bit of federal money. And then we also have a library system foundation that earns about $30,000 a year in grants. All of the money from the library system, not all the money, but money from the library system, then trickles down to each one of the libraries. <coughs> You can see the net revenue here that is actually used by the system headquarters and the amount that's actually allocated to the libraries. And then all this stuff down here is what I think of as library grassroots efforts. These are the efforts that the libraries put forward in obtaining funds, and we have some of the, the community names cut off here, but I think they're on your handout. Um, these are the, the community names that actually make additional appropriations to each of the libraries. We have very active friends groups at each of the libraries raising money to support local library operations. And then each of the library boards also have fundraisers, annual appeals that are going on. They also charge fines for, for overdue materials, interest, all that's in library raise. And then you see the total revenue for each one of the libraries here. So that's a little piece of my brain. So let's, let's move on here. Uh, total operating revenue. Well, one of the things that I want to give you some context about is that Cumberland County is actually one of 55 counties in Pennsylvania that provide support for library services. 40 of these 55, or about three quarters, do this through making an annual appropriation to plan for library services. The remaining 15 counties, like Cumberland County, actually have a tax that was approved by voter referendum at some point. Um, the other thing, if we could just go back a moment, the other thing I wanted to point out were on your handout, these local municipalities down here, out of the 36 municipalities that we have in Cumberland County, the, um, of course all of them are paying the library tax, but these communities, 11 of them, provide an additional $110,000 in support. Um, one of the questions that the commissioners had regarding all of this little mind map here was what happened before the, before the 1986 library tax was put into place? 
And I didn't have time to, to make a, a lovely slide, but I do have a little uh, handout for you. It's just a separate handout with little pie charts. And it tells you that before the tax, 23 Cumberland County municipalities provided support, as opposed to 11 now, totaling about $300,000. At that time, those funds were nearly all federal revenue sharing dollars. And I don't know how many of you lived at the time of Ronald Reagan and federal revenue sharing dollars. It was a long tradition there. But that program <coughs> ended in September 30th, 1986. And that was one of the reasons for my reading of, I, I wasn't working at the library system then. I was too young. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't too young. I just wasn't working at the library system. <laughs> but um, in 1986, the, uh, that was one of the reasons that, they, that library advocates and library supporters sought to have a library tax was because that federal revenue sharing program was ending. And according to my reading of a New York Times article about this, for most communities in America, the federal revenue sharing program provided half, more than half, of their local municipal budgets. So we knew, on the third page of that little colorful pie chart handout, we knew that that column of money from local municipalities, they were being told at that time that that money was going to disappear. They weren't going to have federal revenue sharing dollars to provide support for libraries. So that was one of the reasons, I'm sure one of a myriad of reasons, why the county library tax was put into place in 1986. Um, moving forward here, 2014 operating revenue, um, I told you it was a little over $7 million on that prior slide. The largest chunk of that money comes from local government support, 48%. The next chunk of that comes from what I'm calling the library raised. This could be uh, fundraising. We've also used 9% of reserve funds. I've included that in here. Fines make up 5%. Grants, another 3%. State money used to be down here in this slot. State money at one time provided between 20 25% of our funding. Um, that has declined since 2008. It's pretty significantly. So now it's only providing 15% of our funds. And federal money has always been a pretty negligible part of our budgets. It's been there for in the form of competitive grants. Uh, our operating expenses are really in three broad categories. Staff, uh, we're open 502 hours a week. That's going to be the biggest part <coughs> portion of our budget. Um, most of these people, 80% are part-time people, 174 people are part-time people. The rest, about 44, are full-time. Other, that includes facilities and technology. 29% of our funds goes to support nine different facilities. And collections, <coughs> we spend 12% of our budget, which is the state-mandated minimum amount that we're required to spend on our collections. Now that was just one year. Let's take a look at a five-year span of time. Now on these slides, the other thing that I want to make clear is all of this financial data, unless I've broken it out and you see a library's name associated with it, it's all the libraries put together plus the system headquarters. So it's not just the system headquarters, it's not just one large library, it's everybody collapsed together. In these slides you see stacked bar charts that tell you over a five-year period what has, what has grown. What has declined? Um, obviously, some things have gotten bigger, some things have gotten smaller. The next chart talks a little bit about those trends. Uh, operating revenue trends. As a point of reference, uh, the inflation rate since 2008, when the recession, recession hit, was 14%. Federal money has gone down significantly, but it's really a negligible part of our budget to begin with. State money has gone down a lot gone down an awful lot. And we put out on the, our, the table the requests that we're putting forward to our state legislators this year. Uh, local government money has increased 10%. Library raised money has increased 81%. The use of our reserve funds has increased 14%. For a total overall revenue change of 7% since 2008. And then you can see the comparative figures for uh, five years, five-year period. 
Our expenses, uh, we basically have those three areas of expenditure, staff, collections, and other. Uh, it was a little bit too detailed to tell you what all those different colors are there for collection, but you can see down at the bottom the detail for what it is we're spending. What are these trends looking like? Well, again, the inflation rate since 2008 is 14%, just a point of comparison. Our staff expenditures have increased 12%. Collections have gone down 3%. Other facilities, technology, have declined 12% uh, for an overall change of 3% since the recession hit. This particular slide tells you a little bit about, um, it gives you a way to compare what the Cumberland <coughs> County Library System shows for revenue on a per person basis, on a per capita basis, compared to what the Pennsylvania average is for libraries and then what is compared to the national average for libraries. This data is actually from 2012. It's the most recent data that we have from the national uh, statistics keepers. But you can see on a per person basis, you know, a very tiny amount comes from federal money. The state money is bigger. Uh, local government is even bigger. Library raised is even bigger, or in between state and local government. And then the total amount of revenue per, per person in Cumberland County. So how does CCLS compare? You can read the chart yourself and see where we're higher and lower. Obviously, you know, if you're only taking in 13 cents per person and you're 24% lower, even if it increased and you matched, it's not going to be that material a difference because there isn't that much federal money. But you can see where we stand in comparison to the other categories. <coughs> the next slide is operating expenses per person. Again, the three categories of funding, of spending that we have, staff, collections, and other, uh, and, and what the Pennsylvania library average is and what the national average is on a per person basis. How do we compare when you compare those numbers? Again, you can take a look at those numbers, see what's higher, what's lower, um, and what, you know, in each of the categories and where where we stand on an overall basis. Uh, one of the questions that often comes up is how are we doing in fundraising? And I think we have some really good news to report in that category. This particular slide shows you how each library fares itself in fundraising. So you can see the record uh, for each library here over a five-year period. The kinds of things that libraries are doing to raise that money, the lion's share comes from appeals, donations to, to our constituents, to the people who are using us. And I, I dare say even for some of the people who don't use us, who can afford their own materials, uh, are probably among our largest contributors. Um, sales of merchandise, tchotchkes, tote bags, mugs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, grants, right here, uh, largely for special projects. Special events, it could be library loops, running events, bowling events, walking events, uh, biking events, um, dinners, all, all kinds of things, or Holly House trails, special house tours. And then friends are down here at the end. Our library friends groups do an astonishing amount of work for each of our libraries. This is where the real love of our local libraries comes into play because these are all volunteers who are raising that significant amount of cash. Now friends, could be it could be through membership dues, it could be through appeals from friends, it could be through book sales, a large part of this, most of our libraries have annual book sales, ongoing book sales, book stores, all kinds of things. So friends, thank you friends, that's all I can say. And all of this fundraising really has to do with just operating expenses. It doesn't include any kind of capital expenses. Um, 
And I have a slide next on capital campaign results. In amongst all that other fundraising that we do on an annual basis to make our annual operating <coughs> budgets work, uh, we've had two libraries that were engaged in very significant capital campaigns because that's where we get the money for our, to build our buildings. Uh, legally, we're not permitted to use the library tax for capital campaigns, anything that adds new space to our buildings. The library tax cannot be used in that manner. Um, so we have to go after grants, we have to go after donations, we have to go after all kinds of things. And you can see the amount of money that has been raised in the last couple of years. What's not reflected here are the pledges that have been made for the Shippensburg campaign, the RCAP state grant that the Shippensburg has a contract for. They haven't actually received that money yet, so naturally it's not shown in any of this. But a lot of that work has been done to make that happen in, in the coming years, in this year and in succeeding years. So how is all this funding accomplished? Library boards. Library boards are really critical in this effort. Library Friends, they're independent charitable organizations that raise money and provide funds for each of our libraries. Library staff are very much involved in this. Our, each of our library directors are very involved. Two of our libraries have part-time development staff at Bosler and Fredrickson Library. And uh, just a few years ago, about five years ago, we formed the Library System Foundation. That's a countywide 501c3 that was formed because the library system itself, the system headquarters, is a government agency. And as such, it's hard to apply for grants or receive any kind of charitable donations and clearly indicate to the donor, yes, this is a tax-free gift. So the Library System Foundation was formed, but it was formed in an environment in which we needed to be very sensitive to the fundraising relationships that our libraries already had established at each of their local libraries. So there is, uh, in our bylaws, a limitation on the activities that we can undertake. We're not permitted to solicit organizations or individuals that live or are headquartered in Cumberland County. We can solicit them if we go to the local library board and say, we have a big plan for soliciting Ahold. We think we can get a, a big chunk of money from Ahold for a big county-wide program. The Bosler Memorial Library would have to get, their board would have to give us permission to proceed with that ask because they already have an existing relationship with Ahold. And we can't jeopardize that relationship and make us all look like um, idiots, confused idiots, uh, running around asking for money in our, you know, with our, our hands out in a variety of different ways. So we're working around that, uh, but it is a challenge for us. Efficiencies and cost savings, the last question that I was supposed to at answer. Um, of course, the system headquarters I think of as a way that we have economized and consolidated services. The system headquarters uh, provides basically all the back office operations to our member libraries. So all of our technology is coordinated centrally, all of our collection management services are coordinated centrally, our outreach services, staff training are all done in a central basis so that libraries don't have to take that on locally. Uh, volunteers are another big uh, area. We have a lot of volunteers. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. These are actually people that work in the library. This doesn't count the friends or the board members. These are people that actually put time in helping to shelve books, helping to do a variety of things that are libraries. And finally, you'll see a number of other cost efficiencies and savings listed there. Uh, I won't review all those. I think you can read them, but over the last since the recession hit, so state funding was cut so significantly, we have had to make a lot of adjustments. And um, those kinds of things are what's made our stability possible in the past couple of years. So I look forward to the panelists' discussion. And thanks for your kind attention. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Janelle. A lot of information. So uh, I'm sure you're going to 
need to dig through that over the next few days. So we're going to begin with our panel uh, conversation here. So the first question, actually, we're going to turn to Mr. Miller to respond to. So the first question is, how are public libraries funded? And have there been significant changes over the last 10 years? Loaded question, Mr. Miller. What time do we have to be out of here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> um, can you all hear him? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me OK? It's a complicated story, and I'll try to be brief, which is sort of a standing joke in our association, but let me try anyway. Um, there have been changes in library funding over the years. Um, but in essence, uh, the way to think about this is uh, as a three-legged stool. Uh, Jonelle touched on this in her presentation. Uh, when we look at the ways that libraries are supported, uh, we think of three main uh, funding streams. One is uh, what is provided through local government appropriations or taxes. One is what's provided by state governments. And the third is what is provided, uh, what is raised locally by libraries. We, in the federal government in the um, accumulation of this data refers to it as other, very clever title, but uh, other revenue. And that includes you know, fundraising and fines and copier fees and all the things that uh, are used to generate revenue. In Pennsylvania, we have uh, undergone uh, several transformations, some positive and some not so positive. Um, going back a little further than 10 years, in the late 1990s, 1997 precisely, uh, there was a, a, a pretty um, jarring uh, expose in the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, that was entitled four part series entitled Libraries in Distress. Now, I started in 1995 and this was two years after I began and my, my greatest fear when that series hit was somebody would call me up and say okay what's the solution? Uh, <laughs> and it's not, it's not an easy solution and our libraries really were in distress in 1997 and the four part series really uh, laid out a pretty uh, compelling case about you know where we were at that point. I'm happy to say we're not there anymore, um, but we're also, we also still have a ways to go. Uh, the reason I raise that is that it precipitated uh, a change, a structural change in Pennsylvania, which led to pretty dramatic increases of state support in public library services. So we went from about $29 million uh, up to a high of $75 million uh, in 2003. Uh, in 2003, we uh, went through, we all went as a state, we went through a budget crisis in 2003. I'm having chills just remembering how awful that was because it was focused on the education budget and we're a part of the education budget in Pennsylvania. Uh, so that crisis led to uh, declines in state support. And that decline went from $75 million to initially 37, a half, 50% cut. 10 million of that got restored in the late uh, latter half of that first year. And eventually, three years later, we were able to grow back to the $75 million level. Uh, but then, then the recession hit. And so uh, libraries, like lots of state services, like lots of your local services, took um, budget cuts uh, as we all, everybody tightened their belt. And we were full participants in that in the library field. Uh, since that recession hit, uh, a total of $196 million in library funding has not been received. So that's just on level funding. If we had just level funded from 2007, well, you know, candy and nuts, you know, you know that saying, you know, if, if, uh, I don't know what the saying is, you know what it is. Uh, <laughs> Candy and nuts, right, that's all about a Merry Christmas, but uh, we couldn't, you know, we realized that we couldn't have been uh, maintained at level funding because of the impacts of that recession. We were full partners in the pain. But $196 million just from level funding is a serious setback, and that's where we find ourselves today. The thing I want to highlight about that whole history is this. When we grew the state participation in library funding, there was a requirement on the state's part, as you might understand, for the, the state said, okay, we'll invest more in public libraries, but in turn, we want you to provide more services. And so standards of services also grew during that time. 
And also with that growth came a new funding formula that put in place for the first time uh, real incentives in state dollars <coughs> for greater local support. And as we go through this, I think we'll touch on that, that, that particular challenge in Pennsylvania for local support. We knew in Pennsylvania that absent some state incentives, the, our challenge of raising more dollars at the local, municipal, and county level, school district level, is more challenging. That formula with incentives froze in 2003 when the budget cut of 50% came to be. So that formula has not run since 2003, and the incentives for Cumberland County government, for the school districts in Cumberland County, for municipal governments in, county, uh, in, in Cumberland County, that incentive has been missing all these years. Um, I don't know where we would be if the incentive had been running all those years, um, but I, I have a feeling we'd be better off than we are right now. Unfortunately, that's speculation, and we, we're dealing the, the hand that's, that, that's been dealt playing the handbook that's been dealt. So um, just lastly, and I don't want to go on and on, uh, if, you, if, if the question is how have we fared over the last 10 years, I, um, uh, I'm a, a bit of a pack rat. If anybody's been in my office, you probably know this. And I thought, well, 10 years. I wonder if I actually have the federal statistics from 2002. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and it's interesting. Uh, since 2002 in, in, in Pennsylvania, um, our overall funding, our overall investment in public libraries since 2002 has declined. From we were 32nd in 2002, today we're 40th. Um, uh, in, in terms of our state funding, and this may seem like an ana anomaly and we'll talk about it if you'd like, in, in 2002, <laughs> after all that growth in, in, in state investment, we were third highest in the country in the state's investment in public library services. State money, third highest. Today, that's declined, as you would expect, as John Ellis said. We've, we've, we've uh, suffered some budget cuts, and so we're now ranked seventh in the country um, in uh, state funding. Our local government funding, which is our greatest challenge, has always been historically. We were, in 2002, we were 44th in national rankings, and today we're 46, so we've slipped a little bit on the local funding side. Um, and in the library raise category, the fundraising and so forth, um, we, um, uh, we were 13th in 2002, and today we're 8th. So libraries have stepped up to the plate. They've done a better job of, of raising uh, dollars, even during some very difficult times. So, the, the, the change in 10 years is pretty much that, what I've just laid out. Um, it's a complicated um, quilt in Pennsylvania, funding is. Thank you, Glance. Anyone else like to share? Double? Any thoughts regarding that? <laughs> I thought I was up next. <laughs> you are. You're going to be next. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question. So, Deborah, you're ready for that. Are libraries uh, a public or private good or blend of the two? And we have a, a timeline that I've developed from doing a bit of research about this particular topic. So we're going to take a quick spin from about 1731 to the present. I'm hoping about nine minutes. Um, and um, researching this topic about whether or not libraries are considered a public good, if you go back to the colonial times, they were there weren't really libraries available to people, but what there were were private collections, and there were actually a system of pa parish libraries that existed throughout the eastern United States in colonial times. So even at that time, when books were, needless to say, stunningly expensive, incredibly rare, and had to come over in sailing ships, very carefully packed, they were valued. And the use of them by members of the community was an incredibly valuable aspect of that new society that was being established. Um, in Pennsylvania played a very key role in actually the history of libraries across the country. Starting in 1731, Ben Franklin, who appears to be responsible for so much in Pennsylvania, <laughs> um, he and 50 other members got together and they started the first subscription library. So they pooled their funds together to buy books and they kept them all in one place and people could take them, borrow them, but if they did anything to harm them or lose them, they had to pay up to make sure it came back. 
Um, but it was a very closed system. It wasn't something that was available to very many people, and these were wealthy people who were involved in this particular endeavor. Then in 1813, uh, sorry, skipped one, 1743, Darby, Pennsylvania, opened the first library company. So again, more on a subscription model than a free public library model, but it still was Pennsylvania coming to the fore for libraries. Then in 1813, this federal government got in the act a little bit in terms of how libraries would be used because they decided that they needed to be able to hold on to documentation that was being published every year. Like different laws, different acts that had to do with the Congress, and they needed to, to get them disseminated, but also for them to be someplace central. So they started distributing them to historical societies, university libraries, and the small groups of public libraries that were starting to be in, not public, subscription libraries that were around. So at least they were they were recognizing that need to publicize what they were doing. Then in 1833, the first free public library in America was opened in Peterborough, New Hampshire, the home of the three years off. And it was really just the very tip of the iceberg because things started to change pretty quickly after that. Five years later, in 1838, New York State allocated the first state budget money for public libraries and they and it was pretty, uh, for school libraries excuse me at fifty five thousand dollars and i didn't look up what that would mean in dollars today but that's a pretty substantial chunk in, in 1838 then 10 years later a big step forward boston public library became the first publicly funded and publicly supported library in the united states and that started the real change for, uh, for everything. It was the first model. Boston was an incredibly important city at that period of time. And they did another interesting thing. Uh, at, they were the first library to actually have a children's area in the library. So they were are starting to think about that, that different audiences that libraries were going to reach. And then we moved back to Pennsylvania in the late 1880s and the incredible work done by Andrew Carnegie or Carnegie. I'm not from Pennsylvania originally, so I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but he made a huge difference for communities all across the country. Um, the first library was built in what was then a town called Allegheny, but is now part of the city of Pittsburgh. And he went on to establish, with a huge infusion of cash, over 1,600 libraries across the country. And what Carnegie did was he made people apply for those library funds, so the first grant possibility for libraries. And he required libraries to demonstrate the need for that public library, to provide the building site, to provide 10% annually of the cost of the library's construction and to support its operation, and to provide free service for everyone. So a real democratization of the library system that, with this incredible infusion of cash from Carnegie over a relatively short period of time, from 1886 to 1919. So it made a huge difference in the expansion of libraries across the country. Around that little while later, uh, we have the Amelia Given and Bosler Library opening. And then things changed again during World War I. Uh, during that time, libraries really stepped up to support what was going on in terms of the war effort and became, became much more publicly involved with the community. And they opened their doors, uh, facilities for use by the government, for agencies for creating war-related exhibits, disseminating information from government agencies, such as how to conserve food and fuel, collecting books to create libraries and military camps, and really becoming active participants in the public life during that period of time. And something that's not on your sheet, uh, 1937, the US Department of Education authorized funds for the first library service division. So again, a recognition that libraries were part of the fabric of American life and needed some support. Moving on to 1939, we're in a di getting close to a different wartime, and the American Library Association um, passed their Bill of White Rights, which was in response to what was happening in Europe and the re repressive <coughs> tactics of the regime, fascist regimes in Europe that were burning books, closing libraries, and really closing down the access to information for everyone across that continent. 1941, we've got the New Cumberland Library established. And then uh, another activist time for libraries. 1952, um, it was one of the first times that libraries became very active in terms of promoting voter registration. So again, really trying to reach out to the populace and become actively involved. 
And um, evidently, a study done about that particular election said that, noted that it really made a huge difference. There were much more voter registration and people an increased voter turnout as well. So the libraries were becoming very, very active in their communities. Um, in 1956, the Fed set up, stepped up again, and the Library Service Act was passed by Congress. Um, with, they were going to provide $7.5 million over five years, which even then didn't amount to a really liberal infusion of cash into the libraries. Um, they, that program, however, really emphasized library services in rural, underserved areas, and unserved areas where um, existing libraries were either tiny or non-existent, and, but really focusing on rural rather than urban areas which had a heavier um, preponderance of library services. Then in the 1950s, well, quickly, Fredrickson, Shippensburg, John Graham, and Mechanicsburg Public Library opened up one right after another in a period of about five years. And in 1961, the Library Services Act was renewed, so again, the federal government saying this is important. And then uh, 1964, the act was renamed to note the different focus. They had moved from just supporting general services to include assistance for urban areas, construction, interlibrary cooperation, and a focus on certain target populations, for instance, institutionalized persons. To put that $7.5 million into perspective, the, oh, and <coughs> the, first, the whole first uh, 20 years of funding, excuse me, um, the amount expended by the federal government was amounted to less than the cost of two aircraft carriers. So <laughs> it kind of puts it into perspective. Uh, 1985, East Pennsboro Library opened. 1986, the wonderful voters of Cumberland County approved the library tax. Yes. I remember voting for that. Mm -hmm. Exciting day. Um, in 1996, we see another change in the Library Services Act, and now it was really focusing on technological infrastructure and to emphasize the importance of libraries as access points for computers and the internet. Even with this additional funding, federal funding contributions to public libraries were well below 1% of public library funding across the nation. Now, two dates that are in the wrong order, but 1997, the Gates Foundation also stepped up and recognized the importance of libraries by making their first grants to provide internet services. And according to the Gates Foundation website, uh, in the United States, about a third of those aged 14 and older, roughly 77 million people, use a public library computer or wireless network to access the internet each year. A recent study showed that the library users tend to access more information about health, government, language, and culture than those who use the internet in other public settings. Public library users also report more positive impact on their lives from internet use in such area as health, education, time saving, income, and personal finance. Then moving to um, 2002, the US Congress passed the E-Government Act of 2002. And one of the things that happened with that particular act is it recognized that the US government was moving more and more services online, rather than having paper or other kinds of brochures that were available to people. And what they also did was a lot of those services then moved to the library in terms of people actually providing one-on-one -on -one service to citizens across the country. And the librarians aren't just handing out brochures, they're actually working with uh, patrons of the library to access government services and forms and dramatically increasing the time and financial resources to, to fulfill this ro role. However, this burden um, constitutes an unfunded mandate as governments have not provided public libraries with additional financial or other resources to support these services, especially the broadband connections necessary to really access those services that the government has made available online, but you need to be able to get them. And that's where libraries have come in to really create access for uh, citizens across the country. As Glenn mentioned, 2003 to 2008 saw a huge drop in the funding. Um, but then squeezed in there 2004, there was an increase in the library uh, tax allocations by the county commissioners, for which we were all very grateful. That was a very tough time. Um, actually, during the Great Recession, library usage uh, increased pretty dramatically. And there, so there was a need for more and more funding, and that's when people really had to step back and, as you saw through the Janelle figures, really think of interesting and new ways to be able to support their libraries. 
and I found it something that I, I thought was very interesting, and it's, it's not on the slide because I found it after I had turned in my stuff to Jonelle, but there was, an, uh, there was a study done of the economic impact of the Free Library of Philadelphia. The University of Pennsylvania's Fells Institute of Government proved the, the economic worth of that particular library system. According to their study, the library in Philadelphia alone created more than $30 million worth of economic value to the city in fiscal 2010 and had a particularly strong impact on business development and employment. The study found that an estimated 8,600 businesses could not have been started, sustained, or grown without resources responding resources respondents acquired at the Free Library of Philadelphia. So the direct e economic impact was almost $4 million. So it's, the library is a vital part of our community. Um, people, Americans have stepped up to support their libraries because it was a trusted institution by all aspects of our society. <coughs> and I hope we continue that far into the future. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh in? Oh, God help me, sure. <laughs> <laughs> just a, a couple, just a couple of observations. To say. I, that, this is a, actually very interesting from my standpoint. Some stuff on there that I didn't know. Uh, you know, we we can easily get lost in in numbers. We do this really well in library <laughs> land. Uh, you know, I I, I remember uh, some recent statistics of us. Um, American survey, nine out of 10 believed that the, the library was uh, was vital to their community. Three out of four believed the library was vital to their family. And we can go on and on and on about those things. And, and I do, Lord knows I do. Um, but sometimes we lose sight of the, the why, the why does it matter uh, piece of this. Uh, you know, libraries are that, I won't say uniquely American, but largely, American institution that lifts everybody up, that um, gives everybody a shot. And this was driven home to me uh, several years ago when uh, I was told a story about the playwright August Wilson. I don't know how many people in the room are familiar with August Wilson. I'm a Pittsburgher originally. Uh, grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, my little library in Coriopolis, Pennsylvania, was a vital, a vital place for me growing up. Uh, so if, if I say something out of line tonight, blame them. <laughs> um, and, and I spent a lot of time in the Carnegie Library and the Hillman Library when I went to Pitt. Uh, and then I had the great good fortune to come to Cumberland County in 1987. I lived here for 18 years, and I was thrilled. I, it was a beautiful place to live, and I was very happy to be here. Believe me, I was. Uh, then I found love and moved to Lancaster, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, but, uh, I lived here a long time, but Pittsburgh's home. And this story about August Wilson really drove home an important uh, point for me. Um, great playwright, African-American in Pittsburgh, uh, who wrote a series of plays about the 20th century, a play for each decade of the 20th century, that that told the African-American experience from his perspective. He grew up in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, and then as an adult, uh, eventually moved to Minneapolis and then on to fame and Pulitzer Prize and every award you can think of. Um, anyway, his is a fascinating story. As a, as a, a youngster in Pittsburgh, um, he got in trouble in school. He was, he was a bright kid, but not really a good student. Um, and so uh, uh, one of his teachers challenged him on to, uh, to write a certain paper, and he wrote the paper, did an outstanding job, used the library, and the teacher didn't believe he had written it. And said, you didn't write this. Gave him an F. Got into a big fight and got bumped out of school. Bumped is a nice word. His mom would have no part of him going, not going to school, so she registered him in Gladstone High School, which was a nearby high school in, in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and he was supposed to go to Gladstone. But when he went to Gladstone uh, after the Pledge of the Flag, during the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, he had his neighboring students were um, uh, hurling racial slurs at him. Hmm. And he finally hauled off and hit one of these kids and got in more trouble. Eventually, clear, got himself cleared from that. And, and uh, mom said, you're going to school. He had had enough of school. So off he went every morning to school, not to school, went to the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh for four years. Every day, his mother never knew he hadn't gone to school, went to the Carnegie Library and educated himself. 
So I know Monica's giving me the high sign. I just want you to know that we are that place where the August Wilsons of this world are given a chance. And that's why this matters. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to jump on to question three. And we're going to have Glenn, you're going to start with this one. What role should the public funding and non-public funding play in supporting the library uh, operating and capital costs? What are some of the challenges regarding garnering public and private funding? Um, I took my own time previously, so I'll try to move this along. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that um, for day in and day out operations of any institution like a library, those are the kinds of uh, oper those are the kinds of needs that really ought to uh, come out of the, uh, uh, the public side of the funding street. Uh, the non-public funding side, the, the fundraising side, is, has been a wonderful boost, as Joe now indicated, in terms of what the friends have done and what individuals have done in terms of raising dollars locally. Those funds are less reliable. Uh, they, they rise and they fall, and they're wonderful to uh, build on the basic services that a library has to grow those services to provide a, a higher degree of a higher standard of excellence for those services but really um, in terms of day in and day out uh, from my standpoint uh, the public dollars are what are the dollars that keep those services going now the, the challenges are, are mighty uh, I think um, our turnout tonight is, is a great indicator there's interest in Cumberland County and the challenge for libraries these are the public dollars is the constant need to make sure that the public knows and that our elected officials at all levels municipal officials county level state federal uh, understand that these institutions and the services they deliver matter um, in in the community and so that's an ongoing challenge on the public library or on the public funding side of the street um, the the uh, private side, uh, from my standpoint, I think the, the, the biggest challenge in, uh, beyond the notion that um, everybody's raising money these days, including the Pennsylvania Library Association, uh, the greatest challenge is that um, people want to give uh, to local needs, tangible things that they can touch and feel and smell. And, um, and so uh, it tends to be great for local uh, projects and, 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 and so forth, uh, not so great on a, on, a, on a larger scale. It's a little more difficult on a larger scale. So that would be, that would be my perspective on that. Okay, great. Uh, Deb, do you want to weigh in as a fundraising professional? Well, just in terms of, uh, I, I, agree, I agree very much with Glenn that it needs to be a very mixed set of funding streams to come into the library and that the vitality of the public funding is incredibly <coughs> important because so many of our library patients are not people who can make a gift to the library. A lot of them can, a lot of them do. I mean, just looking at the work that the friends do and the work that each of the library has done to raise private funds, it's just, I, I think it's just incredible. But we serve a huge percentage of people who are barely making it, who are people who are working poor, who are working two jobs, who the only way they can apply for a job is through a computer, and the only access they have to a computer is in the library. The only access that they have to email is in the library. They don't have the resources to be able to be a contributor rather than a user um, of the library. And so the public funding becomes phenomenally important because those are the people who are most vulnerable. Those are the people who we need to get into working jobs, into safe housing, into a stable situation so that they can raise their families and um, be contributors to the community. And so having that diversity of funding streams is just phenomenally important, but you literally can't do it without the public funding. Excellent. Tom, do you want to weigh in, please? Where we get involved, uh, in the way we get involved is in helping um, libraries uh, develop funding sources uh, for special things, capital campaigns and special projects and so forth and so on. In my post-military career where I've gotten involved, I was the uh, first employee in the uh, president, founding president of Whitaker Center, is in raising money for not only big projects but continuing operations and I can tell you it's much more it's much easier 
to raise significant money for charitable causes if you can say to the potential donors, we have the operations covered. I'd like to say it's very difficult to raise money to buy light bulbs. But it's much easier to raise money for kids and kids programs and special programs for kids and things like that. And if we can, as consultants, advise our clients, right Linda? <laughs> if we can advise our clients that um, the, the selling point is not that you need the money just to operate, the selling point is you can do a better job. I made a couple notes here. You can make a difference in people's lives with this money that you can raise. Uh, I spend a lot of my time in Wisconsin. Uh, they have a very much different funding uh, scheme than we have here. I won't go into detail about that. But what, what depressed me about what's going on in Pennsylvania is the, the amount of peop people who are willing to give to support libraries. When I got started with my little paper library card in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I walked up there, and all I could get for that library was books. And I used to come back with a stack of books, and I'd read them, and I'd go back. Okay, now there's so much more in libraries. Now, as a lo loyal member of Simpson Library, I can, if I'm interested in a book, I can get on my uh, computer. I can uh, use my account. I can request that book. I'll get an email telling me when it comes in. I'll go in, it'll be in a stack in the uh, library. I don't even have to talk to the front desk. I just go to the, I'd like to talk to it, but I don't <laughs> have to talk to the front desk. And I get my book and I check it out myself, all by myself. You know, my PhD's in history. I can actually do that. I can check it out. <laughs> so, I don't, she's probably waving at me, but I can't see. I, <laughs> the point of the matter is that if, if the, if the, uh, I guess I'll say governmental sources can cover the day-to-day -day operations. It makes it so much easier for the people in library land, Linda taught me that, library land, people in library land to raise the additional money and to get the volunteers and the excitement to do great things for kids, great things for kids. So uh, it, it's important to get the basics covered so we can do a lot more. Excellent, thank you. All right, question number four. Move it. There, there we go. Okay, we're going to direct this back to Glenn. How does Cumberland County's current funding sources of revenue model compare to other um, organizations or to other uh, counties or states? And what changes should be considered? Uh, First of all, but let me begin with the basics. Uh, Jonelle talked uh, about the number of counties in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania 67 counties, uh, that provide uh, support for libraries. I think I need to begin with uh, something I touched on earlier, I think, which is the, the nature of Pennsylvania. Those of us who are native Pennsylvanians, I think, you know, uh, Tom is a Wisconsin guy, you know, you had to, you had to come to learn the uh, a really strong passion for local control and local uh, uh, government in Pennsylvania. And we understand that and was affected, and, but it is something that we have to deal with year in and year out. We are in Penn's Woods, and in Penn's Woods we have 3,100 <laughs> units of government that uh, Pennsylvanians choose. We have boroughs, townships, cities, counties, home rule municipalities, school districts. Did I leave anything out? I think I covered them all. But it's 3,100 pieces. You can argue whether that's a good model or a bad model. It is what we have. Uh, and, and that presents a real challenge for a service like libraries because libraries have service areas and they may have one municipality in their service area. They may have 12 in their service area. And now you're trying to deal with 12 pieces of the puzzle to pull together a, a budget. That is one of the great challenges in Pennsylvania. So in Cumberland County, um, I would say that uh, your funding model, you're already several legs up on the rest of the state. A, you have a really strong, effective county library system that does great stuff, that does that it's cost effective because they, they coordinate back office operations and do some something centrally to save libraries. 
money locally. So you have a huge leg up in that. You have a huge leg up because you have dedicated funding going into that library system. So that's also uh, to the good. You, you have a leg up because this is a system that is heavily used. Uh, Jonelle talked about this when I heard her presentations in the past. Uh, no county exceeds Cumberland County in the borrowing and use of library materials. Cumberland County is number one. Not Bucks County, not Montgomery County, not Allegheny County, not Dauphin County. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Cumberland County is the most heavily used library system in Pennsylvania. So those are all strengths on, on, on which to build. And uh, so you already have a, a terrific network here. Uh, sure, you have libraries. They have their differences from now and from time to time. But by and large, you have a library system that functions really well. And so that's a, that's a great model on which to build. Um, what changes should be considered? Uh, we're talking about those changes. You've had a great, you have great panels in the past talking about the, the vision for Cumberland County's uh, library future. Uh, as I think you saw on the numbers, we have progress that we need to make on the funding side of the street. Uh, there's just no escaping that. And so for, in order for this library system to really thrive and to do the kinds of services that uh, the citizens of Cumberland County deserve, um, you know, we're, just, we're gonna have to step up our game here in Cumberland County. I don't think there's any way around that. Now, uh, tonight's, um, tonight's draft night in the NFL. I don't think anybody has their phone open tonight trying to figure out who moved, moved up in the draft and tried to choose number two. You know, did the Eagles get up to, I'm a Steelers fan, but I raised that for this reason. <clears throat> 2012, Cumberland County Library saw in their front door 1.2 million people, 1.2 million people came in physically to the library. That's not, doesn't count the people who came via the web, who came to their library. That's 1.2 million people. As much as I love the Pittsburgh Steelers, that's more people than saw the Steelers that entire year, home and away. That's more people than saw the Eagles, home and away. That's more people than saw the Ravens, home and away in 2012. It's uh, a lot of folks, and that's just Cumberland County. 67 counties in Pennsylvania, there's a ton of people who are using libraries. You have a great asset here on which to build. So many things, you're so far ahead in many ways. Um, and so this is a wonderful opportunity for the library to, to work with their constituents, with their elected officials, and to build the, the, the shining uh, crown jewel that this, real, this library system could really be. Karen, would you like to weigh in? Excellent. How does it compare to Dauphin County Library System's funding model? Well, I think this question, uh, I think it's going to be an easy one. Can you speak into the microphone a little more? Sorry. I took this question thinking it was going to be an easy one to answer because I think the underlying question here is is it better to have centralized funding or is it better to have decentralized funding? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> After I looked at the, uh, the numbers, um, there's a lot to be said for centralizing your fundraising. That's the knee jerk response that you would get, I think, from most fundraising professionals is that you can have a more consistent message, you can have a more consistent game plan that way. Can everyone hear you? Yeah, Karen. Sorry. You can track and analyze your your donor information more practically that way. You can do a better job sometimes of making sure that those donors are being stewarded properly. They're being banked when they should be banked and they're being followed up with when they should be followed up with. That's all part of what you get from, from centralized fundraising. And there are certainly cost efficiencies involved with, especially with things like bulk mail and other endeavors where you know, you're going to not want to spend that money eight different times. But having said that, and having looked at the numbers that Janelle provided you, and Janelle, I have to tell you, the only thing better than looking at that slide of yours is looking at that slide of yours while you're making a little red light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a little dizzy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's the first time I ever Somewhere used one. <laughs> Uh, Cumberland County Library System is doing a pretty phenomenal job of, of private fundraising with this decentralized model. And in particular, the Friends Group fundraising is it's, it's staggering. What they're doing is 
really amazing. Compare, I will compare them directly to Dauphin County. Even given the differences in some of the way we count for things, it's easily eight times more than what we get an income from friends groups in Dauphin County. Now, some of that may be because some of the friends groups are doing the things that we do centrally. They're doing for your individual libraries, like they're doing the direct mail campaigns while we do that centrally in our office. But um, I, I was born and raised in Cumberland County, grew up in Carlisle. I, I know how it all works. And I would be very hesitant to say, to do anything to destabilize the relationships that have been built in the communities by the friends groups and the libraries themselves who have started on doing some private fundraising initiatives of their own because fundraising is all about building relationships and keeping the relationships going and if you take a step that's going to destabilize that and you don't have a good way to make up for that with the centralized system you could you could hurt yourself in the long run um, and one of the things that has come up here a few times and that's the challenge for fundraising is the notion that people only want to support their library. They want to support their community and people in their community. And that is something that we struggle with all the time. And an area where a centralized approach, if you incorporated it well with your existing tactics, with the friend groups and what the libraries are doing, it, it might help with that, is I found that when you talk to donors about poor services and the impact that those have on a certain group of people, or you're talking about serving a particular uh, demographic of the population, there tends to be a breaking away of, of thinking that they have to focus all their money and their attention in a particular geographic area. They can see that and be willing to support that on a broader base. If you're talking about helping at-risk kids get the best start they can possibly get to keep them from being so far behind the curve when they get into school, People are less likely to say, I only want to do that for the kids in my community. I don't want to do it for the kids and the people you know, who live across the river or whatever. So, I mean, that is an area where I think it could be a, um, a creative opportunity for some centralized fundraising. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say, which is really more of a, a point for the, what challenges do be faced with this, is that fundraising takes time. And it takes staff time and volunteer time and it takes resources. So it's, it's, um, it's not a minor investment. And it takes sometimes a while for it to pay off. You have to be invested in it. We're about, in Dauphin County, about to embark on an endowment campaign. And the point of the endowment campaign is to do exactly kind of what we're talking about here tonight, is to provide a funding stream for the Dauphin County Library System that's not reliant on public money, that is you know, helping to fund it and its core services through another manner. But in, for the most part, you're talking about planned gifts and bequests. And so you're not going to see this. So if you're putting the money and the time in now, you're not going to see the benefit of that for many years. And that's just the way it works when you get to, to that type of fundraising. So um, the coordinated asks and the messaging and the efficiencies are all important, but I think what you're doing is also pretty phenomenally uh, successful compared to what a lot of other libraries are able to do. Great. Excellent. Deborah, would you like to weigh in? <laughs> Please? Well, the one thing I would add is that I think one of the things that people do forget is the amount of time it takes to raise money. It is about building relationships. It is about talking to people. It is about writing grants and writing good grants and good proposals that really reflect the needs of your particular library. A grant cycle for a major foundation can be between 18 and 24 months between the time that you, they put out the RFP saying we're getting ready to give away money to when they actually give out that money. So there's always that lag time. You're putting in huge amounts of work. And I, I've heard people say to me, people have said to me over time, you know, well, you write one grant application, can't you just cut the yeah, case and yeah. use that in the next grant application? Yeah. It would be so wonderful. <laughs> Every funder has a slightly different way of asking a similar question, so you have to frame it differently and move things around, and it takes time to do that. And you can't use a boilerplate again and again and again. It would make life ever so much simpler. Um, and funding streams have changed. I mean, if you look just even in our area alone, um, if you look at the changes, the loss of, all the of many of our manufacturers that have left the region, and they were 
AMP was a huge supporter of nonprofit organizations across our counties, and they're they're gone. Um, but you look at Jim Carlisle. I mean, look at Carlisle. The Maslin Factory for the, uh, Corporation was a huge supporter of the library as well as other things in Carlisle. That's all gone. Um, you look at the banks, which have been very supportive over time. They're all getting consolidated, so there's fewer opportunities to be able to, you know, you don't have 50 banks anymore. I'm making that number up. You know, maybe you have 30, and looking at all the consolidation that's going on in a little while, there may be 20. So there's just that fewer, you know, fewer funding streams. And as the consolidation of major uh, corporations across the country, the same thing is happening. Mm -hmm. And many corporations, if you go onto their website where they used to support things locally where they had plants, now you have to go to a centralized website where you put in your stuff. It doesn't matter where you are in the country. And they may have decided also, the only thing they're going to do is fund this particular thing, whether it be education or hunger and homelessness or the envir environmental causes. <coughs> so you're frozen out from those people, those entities because they won't look at the more general, broader stream for funding. So it's just, it's harder. And even though, I think if I remember correctly, the last statistic I saw was that 80% of private funding, sorry, private philanthropy across the country was from individuals, that still leaves that 20% that's from foundations and corporations and is an important funding stream for any nonprofit. So it's just, it's hard. And it takes a lot of time. And as somebody noted earlier, I think it's only Fredrickson and Bosler that have part-time development people. So that means it's on the fundraising is being done in part by people who also have a full-time job running the library. So I mean, how do we want those folks to allocate their time for the best use to, for the benefit of the library and our community? It's just something to think about. Great. Thank you. Tom? Thank you. Uh, I've known. Uh, and respected Deb and uh, Tan for no, I can't, can't say many years when you're talking about women. Oh, sure you can. Many One years is great. <laughs> many years. Uh, and I do appreciate what they have to say, and there's no but to this. When you think about the client, when you think about the situation for here in Cumberland County, when we raised money for Whitaker Center, we raised over 52 million. I was the president there. We could walk into a bank president's office right here in Cumberland County or Dauphin County, and they could right in front of him say, well, we'll give you $100,000. Nancy, you remember that in those days, okay? You could do that. You can't do that anymore. So the one point I'd like to try to make as far as this question and this issue is concerned, and they've mentioned it, uh, is relationships. Relationships are even more important now than they ever were before. And how many times do I in my consulting work run into where we interview potential, we don't ask for money, but we interview potential donors, and they say, we gave the last campaign, we, we're working for uh, Palmyra Library now, we're working for Adams County Library, we work with Bosler. We gave for the last campaign, we haven't heard anything from them in 15 years. The important thing is to maintain relationships and develop relationships and cultivation. And she'll shut me up when the time comes. But I can tell you, tell you the number of people of substance with whom I talk, with whom I speak, I should say, uh, who have never been in any of these libraries. They have no idea. They, as someone <coughs> earlier said, they have the money to buy their own, and so they don't worry about They have no idea what goes on in Bossler. And when Linda showed me how many people every day come in Bosler and use the computers just to do job searches and things, they have no idea of that. They think that libraries are just paper books, and they're not. There's so much more. So my um, point here is that when we talk about fundraising, yes, public dollars are extremely important, but it's a public-private partnership we're talking about here. It's working together, and part of the the, the uh, part of your supporters, part of our supporters, are people of substance who need to be, if you pardon the expression, cultivated. They need to be invited to the library. They need to be t taken on a private tour of the library. They need to sh be, be shown um, what happens in a library. And I'll close with this one anecdote. I won't mention who it was, but a, re a retired um, official at Hershey who, whose, whose salary used to be in the uh, in the annual report, that means the top five, told me he's never been in his local library. 
never ever once been in his local library. He doesn't need to go in there. If I were working for that library, I would say, invite him, get him down, show him what's going on, explain to him. And one of the things that has really impressed me about this series that you all have put together is, I'm a voter here, that all three commissioners have been here for all men. Thank you very much for coming and staying. It's much appreciated. I wanted to talk about some trends in fundraising that I do think that libraries and nonprofits should know and can use to capitalize on the uh, And the first one is impact reporting. There's been a shift uh, in how donors want to talk about their money. When they give you money, they now want to know what is happening with that money. They're not just given to an organization because it's an organization. They want to know what impact that, that dollar that they've given you is having. So for libraries, that can be a little bit of a challenge because we are so many things to so many people. It can be hard to narrow that down. Um, it, it's also, you need to be able to talk about the services that you provide in terms of what it costs for you to provide that service and create that impact. And I don't know that we've always been set up to answer those questions, but it's definitely some, a way that we need to go to talk to donors. <coughs> You need to tell them there's a, a formula for course called money impact and I don't care what the key stands for, but you need to tell your donors how much money was raised, what you did with it, and what the outcome of it was. So that's definitely a big thing to look at. And that's part of building the relationship with the donor too. You're going back to them after you've gotten the gift to tell them what what you've done with it. That's a big part of building the relationship that Tom is that we're talking about. Um, and asking for unrestricted gifts can actually hold fundraising back in that regard because if you can't articulate that to a donor, they're, they're hesitant to support you sometimes. Um, and you need to be able to report measurable results. And there again, that's something that libraries can talk in numbers, but, but we also need to be able to talk in answers about what people have done with that service and how it's improved their lives. And I think a lot of us do that. We, we started to gather those stories, but it's definitely, I think, a trend that you need to keep moving forward on. Um, the next thing I mentioned is engaging women. The Huffington Post just reported that 64% of all charitable gifts are made by women. Go. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I think this is a really good, uh, good omen for libraries is that 62% of people who use libraries are women. Go out and talk to the women in the community. They are likely to be your supporters. Um, reach out to them. Just from personal experience, I would ask you not to call them ladies, however, because many of my donors have told me that they prefer not to be called ladies, so I'm just sharing that with you. <laughs> As a lady and gentleman, I suppose. Yeah, I, I would also uh, suggest engaging millennials. Um, and once again, don't call them millennials. My 21 year old daughter will tell me she can't stand it. She doesn't ever want anybody to call her a millennial again. So I'm just sharing that with you. That's handy, goes away. Um, the, the research on millennials, I mean, they're, they're soon going to be, I think, does the slide say they're 75% of them? Yeah. It's in your handout. Very soon. Hand out. Mm -hmm. very soon. Um, they care more about issues than organizations. So that goes back to the donor practice of telling them what the money's going to do. They usually develop as volunteers first. So engaging them as a volunteer with your organization would be a good first step to building that relationship. Um, and I think uh, that, that brings me to the next point. Optimizing volunteers is another thing to focus on because volunteers, by and large, are bigger donors than other people to your organization. So the friends groups of the library here in Cumberland County are a primary example of that. I mean, look at how much how much fundraising they're doing for you, and that's all volunteer. I'm assuming it's all volunteer. Um, other things to look at, online and mobile fundraising. It's kind of big and it's getting bigger. More and more people want to donate online. More and more people want to be able to donate through their phone or their smart device. Make it easy and fast for them. I, I would suggest beginning with email because email solicitation for us anyway has been very successful. We've had a lot of people well, we communicate with our donors with a newsletter, a periodic newsletter, but then we do periodically make asks by email and they're very well received. We have a high click-through rate and a high donation rate from that. So I would suggest starting there because social media, while it's the darling of everyone right now, talk about time consuming. It can be very time consuming. 
and not necessarily something that's going to immediately translate to the funding for you. It's not that I'm saying that you shouldn't do it, but I don't know that you should take it. You, you can institute it and immediately see the result from it. And then I think the last thing to remember is that direct mail is still a heavy hitter, which I think is surprising to a lot of people. It's, you know, they don't think direct mail is effective anymore. It still is. It is trending down a little bit, but it is still the heavy hitter for fundraising. And it's almost, I think you're seeing a slight resurgence because people get so much email now that getting an actual letter is, you know, it's like a relief. It's <laughs> <laughs> my email inbox. <laughs> so it does get their attention, perhaps. You know. uh, it's not inexpensive, you know, or fast to do, but it's definitely worth the effort. And it looks like you're already doing that. So those are the trends that I would see to, to jump on, and I think it's very neat that you're doing runs and bowling things and that type of thing, because those are also uh, they're popular, although special events can be a decent to themselves, and oftentimes they are more popular than they ever really bring in, so the word of caution on that. Yeah. That one's true, you probably have something to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one of the great things about uh, direct mail fundraising is that people have a tendency to put that envelope on the pile for bills and other things that they're going to do later where an email is just so easy to delete. It just goes away. Or you can have that piece of paper. But if you're doing a direct mail campaign, you have to create the direct mail piece, figure out what your mailing list is, keep your mailing list up to date, find some way to create the pieces, print the pieces, stuff the pieces, stamp the pieces, get it to the post office, pay for the postage, and then wait and see what happens. And then make a decision whether or not you follow it up with a phone call to really cement the ask. So it does, it's just, fundraising is expensive and time intensive. And like Karen, I agree, special events is a very tricky area. You have to be incredibly careful managing them so that you do get a good return. But one of the major benefits to special events, though, is that you engage with your donors. You're seeing them face to face. You have your volunteers doing something fun. I mean, there could be good things to go. But it, it's a delicate balance. I think you're, really, you're right. And the whole social media thing is a swamp. It is so incredibly time con con consuming. And you just don't, it's very, very difficult to quantify whether or not where your benefit's coming from, from those kinds of things. But it's also the way of the future, it's the way people are moving, and we're going to have no choice but to pay attention to it. Great, thank you. Tom, Glenn, did you want to pipe in? No. <laughs> okay, great. So um, we have our final question. So we're kind of stealing from our last uh, panel discussion. Headline for the future. Um, what will the headline say about Cumberland County Library System in 2020 if we do things right from a financial standpoint? Who would like to start? <laughs> no. I did forget to prepare this question, but what I would hope it would be is something along the line of banner year for libraries in Cumberland County in 2020. Excellent. I did think about this actually, uh, and I can envision a headline that says, Cumberland County Literacy and Employment Rates Best in the State. Excellent. Subhead is Investment in County Libraries Seen as a Term. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Tom? That was much better than what I thought. <laughs> Yeah. I, I bow to his. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Excellent job. All right. So now we're trying at, at the part of the program where we're uh, looking for questions from the commissioners and the Cumberland County Library Board. And at this time, those uh, in the audience who might have questions, if you would take your three by five cards and write out your questions for us, that'd be great. So, Commissioner, I have a quick one. Well, yes. Um, uh, let's on slide eighteen. It's just a. Uh, Okay. An answer to um, what's the difference on donations and friends? Uh, it, may, it may have been um, already explained. On 18, I was just a little confused as to the difference between donations and friends. Um, I mean, donations seem to be right. pretty high. 
Right. The donations would be things that the library board and staff are in charge of. Uh, maybe direct annual appeals, uh, donations that come through the jars at the circulation desk. Um, they do not include donations that come through the Friends books. The Friends are separate 501c3s. And so they may receive a donation to their organization, and then the Friends then would pass it on. They would make a budgetary decision to say, this year we raised $92,000 and we're going to give $90,000 to the library. And the other $2,000 we're going to put aside for that future building program that we know is going to happen. Did that answer your question? I guess so. And then special events could be from the friends or could be from the anybody special, else. The special events, everything that's not listed under friends is a special category. That's the money that those 501c grants okay. raised. And then all the other stuff, except for the friends, is the money that the library board raised or library staff raised. At the individual libraries. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, it is a little confusing. I mean, I'm doing the special event. So, but okay. it, yeah. so it could include special events. Okay. But the friends also, in the, within what I didn't do was I didn't break out all the, the donations, special events, and things that the friends do. I just lumped it all okay. together. <clears throat> Okay. You know, can yes. I answer that some of that? Sure. Alicia is a friend's extraordinary person. <laughs> I'm the vice, uh, uh, the assistant treasurer of the PCBL, that's Pennsylvania Citizens for Better Libraries, and we are the ones that are in charge of all of the friends groups. We ask them to uh, give us a report every year, and the way that they work is the library's directors give us a list every year, give the libraries, the, gives the, the friends groups a list of what they would want them to, for us, to, for us to fund. And then we meet with our boards and we decide how much money we're going to give to each library. We always honor the uh, request of the, of, the, of the directors because they know that we are their arm to raise funds. And that's Pennsylvania Citizens for Better Libraries. Does that answer your question, Ms. Cross? It does. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, commissioners? Okay, so um, I'll, just, I'll direct this, I guess, and I, I may have a follow up. Uh, well, I'll direct it to Glenn. So, um, you know, there seems to be, at least if you look, and we heard a lot of statistics tonight, and I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists. Um, but there seems to be, you know, what, what appears a contradiction, uh, and that is, you know, according to the slides and the information we received tonight, is we have this, in Pennsylvania, we have not enough local government support. Correct. Uh, and yet, if you look at the numbers, uh, the county property tax, dedicated tax, mm -hmm. uh, you know, essentially provides three out of every four dollars in support of our county library system. So what what is it that occurs in the other states uh, that provides for, you know, increased local support? Good question. Thanks, Jim. Uh, can't speak. <coughs> Excuse me, can't speak for every state, but I'm aware of uh, some of our neighboring states. Uh, uh, New Jersey and New York have um, uh, dedicated, first of all, they have state laws that mandate uh, library <coughs> services. So if you're going to have a library, then you have to fund it at XYZ level. So there are uh, state mandates in place. There are also uh, local government uh, mandates taxation that are dedicated uh, streams to the library. So that one slide that uh, compared, uh, I think compares Pennsylvania with uh, New York, New York, uh, Ohio, uh, Florida, and Texas. We try to get some comparably sized <coughs> places, but the places that are high funders are places where there's a mandate in place and the, and the tax is, is directed to library services. It'll come as no surprise uh, when uh, I tell you that the 
when you look at the other measures of this national survey of all the data, that's the, fin the finding piece is just a piece. Then you look at all the service measures, you know, how many books are borrowed, how many computers are available, how much uh, professionally trained staff is there. Uh, the places uh, that are well funded are those places that also have high service measures as well. So there is a there is a dichotomy. We're Pennsylvania. We we uh, uh, we do things uh, in a uniquely Pennsylvania way, and and um, and so the, the short answer is that uh, those places that high have high local support are by and large places where there is uh, some sort of a mandate in place. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, and one of the things that, that I looked at is that, you know, here in Pennsylvania, we have about uh, 15 pages worth of state mandates, um, you know, with respect to what our, our public libraries have to do. Um, and I think that, you know, if you examine the issue as to why we need additional funding, uh, you have to look, you have to look to the state because that is where the cuts have occurred. If you look at the county property tax that's dedicated, and I'll tell you what, uh, you know, we're very fortunate in Cumberland County to have a dedicated levy just to support our public libraries because we have a lot of other priorities in this county as well. Uh, this is certainly one of them. Uh, and I am a big believer in the fact that, you know, essentially our libraries are tremendous community assets for young and old. Um, but anyway, to go back to what I was saying is one of the you know, concerns I have is that 16% of our library users come from outside of Cumberland County. And yet our, our county's property taxpayers you know, are paying for those folks uh, because we're not receiving the adequate support from the state library access part that we should be receiving which essentially is the funding that makes sure that everybody, no matter where you come from, can come to a public library and get, you know, their books and materials and whatever free of charge. It's a free and open a public library system. So I'll just mention this, and I don't know whether any of our state legislators are here tonight. I don't see any of them. But we have six state house members. Actually, today now we have five. Uh, and we have three state senators. Right, and they should they should be a part of this process uh, because you know when I look at the numbers, and let's just you know we heard some statistics. <clears throat> the voters of Cumberland County in 1986 approved a dedicated tax for our libraries uh, that generated eight hundred and fifty three thousand two hundred thirty six dollars, and that was the first year full year of collection, 1987. Uh, as our county's economy and tax base expanded, the county library tax grew gradually and naturally by 64% to a total of $1,318,236 by the end of 2003. And as we heard before, in 2003, uh, the commissioners at that time, because there was a threat of reduced funding from the state, I think Governor Rendell had proposed like a 50% cut and ended up somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 27%, 30 okay. But in any event, um, the commissioners at the time doubled the tax, uh, which you know went from 1.3 million to, to uh, generating nearly $2.7 million in 2004. And a portion of those funds, as we know, was put into a strategic reserve uh, you know, uh, because of those those cuts and because of, you know, they didn't want to, they didn't want it to be spent at the same time. That's the way I understand it. Uh, to meet uh, you know needs that came along. So, in between 2004, um, you know, and today, um, that tax has grown naturally by an additional five hundred uh, five hundred thousand dollars. Where we're, um, I'm sorry, uh, we're at the we're at the point now where we have essentially 3.2 million dollars coming from the library tax that generated uh, 2.7 million in 2004. Um, so, you know, I guess what I'm asking is, um, 
we have these, these two pages that you know, Janelle has circulated here tonight, uh, which is a, a request for state lawmakers uh, to address some of these issues. Um, before we have to go back to the inequitable property tax to help fund our libraries, it would be nice if the state would restore you know, the funding that they've got. Now, uh, some of you know I worked for a while in the state center. And uh, I worked for the late Senator Michael Pitt, Brooks County. And I got to tell you what, uh, what, the, what those of you did every budget year, uh, the advocacy for libraries was pretty significant. And I know my boss paid attention to that. And he advocated and fought for, you know, an increase in state funding for our library system. Now, we, you know, he wasn't always successful in doing that. But again, we have six state legislators, and three minus one today, and uh, three state senators. And I think it's important that they hear Paul uh, to restore the funding uh, to our library system. So I would ask that, um, you know, we can go out of this meeting tonight uh, committed to do that. Thank you. Well, you've already prepared the letter. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that our opponent's already done, right? Oh. Yeah. No, no, so no. the letter's already been prepared? No. And so the letters to the yeah. state legislators yes. have already. Yeah. Monica, can you take yes. us back to the operating revenue? Not for what slide it is. Operating revenue per person. Jim, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more uh, in terms of the state role in this. Um, absolutely uh, agree, and we welcome uh, the help of um, the uh, uh, yeah, operating revenue, revenue per person. We welcome the help 13. of the county commissioners uh, uh, and every citizen of Cumberland County, every citizen of Pennsylvania, yeah. reaching out to uh, yeah. Yeah. our um, there you uh, there you go. Uh, uh, reaching out to our state elected officials. That's absolutely going to be critical one for two reasons. One is the dollars are critical, um, so that's important. And, and 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 if we are in fact in a year when Harrisburg is going to increase mm -hmm. education, by golly, there's got to be a library piece component of that as well. So that's going to be an important uh, piece of this, no doubt. The other element that's important related to that is if we could get significant enough dollars that would allow us to run the funding formula again, that would help everybody as well, particularly Cumberland County, who has suffered on two fronts. One, by no incentive there that hasn't helped you when you step up the plate do more so that would be a, an advantage and the second is because you have a lot of out of county borrowers if we had that access program back funded we'd be able to uh, um, uh, to support Cumberland County uh, more effectively now I'm sure Karen would tell you that there are people from Cumberland County who come over and use the Dolphin China so it's a it's a it's an it's an evil across the board that we need to rectify unfortunately dollars aren't there uh, but the reason I ask to, to have this this call back up is I completely agree, and I think if my personal view in terms of funding is the solution for Pennsylvania is more of a state-based focus than, than in some other states. But even if you accept my point of view, even if I could wave a wand and make Harrisburg do that, <coughs> if you looked at the national averages here, you see that we're already significantly ahead of the, of the national average in terms of state per capita. I argue that it needs to be higher. I agree with you, and I think it ought to be higher. But where we're getting clobbered is at the local level. And I'm not just talking about the county. I'm talking about other levels of government. But that's, that's a place in Pennsylvania, and it's not just Cumberland County. And, and there, are, there are many counties in Pennsylvania that are in far worse condition than this. And it, would, and it wouldn't be the case that we would rank, whatever I said it was, 44 to 48 uh, in the country. That's a real problem for us and a real challenge for us because we have so many levels of government, so many fragments of government. So this is this is our problem. I completely agree with the notion we need to we need to really work together hard to, to try to move the needle in Harrisburg. But with that, we also need to move the needle locally because where we're really suffering in Pennsylvania, generally speaking, and, and it's true in Cumberland County as well, as much as I love this, and as much as the commissioners of this county historically have affirmed year and year and year in and year out the value of public libraries, we still have a big challenge ahead of us here just to get, you know, we're behind the Pennsylvania average here in Carolina County and we're way behind the national average here. Um, so we got work to do, but when I say we, I mean we. That means the library community as well. 
Uh, so we have to be working in the fields to, to make sure that, that, that people who use libraries, who value libraries, are making their voices heard as well. I mean, we can't ask our, ask our elected officials to do these things if there's not a sense that the public is going to support them. Um, so at any rate, I just wanted to, to make that point. I, I, I completely agree, Jim, and, and we're going to be working like the devil between now and June 30th to try to move the needle in Harrisburg. But we got to do more than that, and I'm hoping we could get those incentives back, and that would help us across the board. Excellent. Thank you. Terry, did you want to weigh in? I'm refining a question in my head, but I prefer okay, we'll to give back. the board members the opportunity to okay. ask questions. Okay, uh, board members. Sue. Um, Sue Simmons. Yes. <laughs> Look at you, Gary. <laughs> Do you want me to keep this up here, or do you want me to go back to the other no, It's not necessary. Okay. Um, but my question, is, and I don't know who would answer it, is that we are a class three mm -hmm. county, is that? Yes. We've been moved out. <clears throat> and I think there are 13, well, 13 other uh, class three. What is the comparison that the, the counties put towards their libraries? How do we compare? Are we at that change your yes, reimbursement? Yes, your, yes, you know, that, that definitely yes, hurts. That, that hurt. uh -huh. but, but but the formula is not running, right. so it doesn't. It doesn't. It, and when the formula runs, that will hurt you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think I'm right about that, Janelle. It hasn't yeah. impacted yet, but it That's will. Correct. That's correct. It will. Uh, but no, I, 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 I would like to, to know where we compare, and, and, and I think that would give us a method to say to the commissioners, look, this is where we are. Mm -hmm. um, among the third class county yes. mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. We'll be happy to, to dig that answer. Okay. Okay. I'm Thank sorry I, don't, I can't tell you off my head. To you. Karen? Well, no, I was just going to make a comment that Dauphin County is, I think it's funded at a higher rate than, than Cumberland County, and we're in the same, in the same category. Mm -hmm. What percentage of CCLS is Money is uh, what percentage of your budget comes from the no, local like 46, 48 percent, somewhere in there? Yeah, the so ours is closer 60 to 63 percent of our okay. so, so Dauphin County per, uh, contributes 62 percent, yes. Okay, yeah, I think we're at 13 dollars per capita, and I think you guys are around. 18, 19 per capita, but I really need to check before I yeah, say I that. Have, I don't have those numbers, but I'm sure it's higher. Of course, it's a little hard to compare apples to apples okay, because yes. the, the Dauphin County Library System, uh, Hershey and Middletown are not part of the equation. They're departments of local government, so there's no tax levy there for, for us. They get their money as an allocation from the township or the borough, whichever it is. Okay. Excellent. Uh, board members. Uh, board members. Okay. Uh, I have a few audience questions here. Oh, yo, sir. Yes. We go back to that beautiful, uh, <laughs> slightly complicated chart. Sure. <laughs> Actually, we don't need to, but if you look at the bottom of the line, there's an incredible disparity. Um, it's not quite accurate, I might say, for 2015 because Bossler is getting some money from South Middleton and some money from Carlisle, but it's a pittance. And even the, in the cases where you get some more generous support, it's still a pittance. Um, how do we approach these people in local government? when the first thing they will say to us is, oh, but we're already paying the county library tax. Our citizens are already paying for your libraries. Is there an approach uh, where we can go and just get something, not just a, we're going to be nice to you, here's, here's 50 cents. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'm just going to say, I want to turn to our, our fundraising experts on that, but the, um, I, I, my gut tells me, and having lived in, in Cumberland County and, and having known Joan L and the work that's been done here for a lot of years, uh, I know that's a, a, a challenge that's unique, unique but for counties where there is a dedicated tax that, that adds a level of uh, another obstacle to, to another hurdle. I would think it's sort of like the fundraising approach 
I think you, we, there needs to be something specific to that municipality, specific service, specific constituency. I'm not sure how that works, but yes. my guess is that, that the more localized you can make that as, the better off, better your chances, because, you know, people are going to say, well, we got a, we got a county library tax, and, you know, why should I do extra? And I think the answer lies in the special nature of what Absolutely. you're asking for. Yeah, like in our, in our uh, system, uh, we get a little bit extra money from lower tax in the township. That's where our biggest library is. I mean, by far our biggest library. They do 50% of the business in the county. So, I mean, that's, you know, you can justify making the ask based on that. And this is the, actually, the very good point is the other side of the coin, too, for private fundraising is that you will often encounter people who say, well, you know, my local government or my state government are supposed to be providing a service for me. Why are you asking me for a donation? And I, I'm not sure it was Tom or Glenn made, I think, a very good point about talking about, you know, keeping the, the doors open and the lights on is one thing, but there are a lot of things that we need to do to extend library service into the community that private dollars can really help us do. Things like outreach to at-risk communities and, you know, some of the other programs that are not necessarily just you know, general day-to-day -day operations. I, I agree that specificity is probably where your best bet is in terms of the path towards making a fit to local governments and talking about the specific library in that community, what it provides, the services that it provides to all different kinds of people, and getting statistics about who's using it, children's programs, you know, very specific pro information and data about the programs that are being offered and usage. And um, what someone was talking about before was the computer usage. I mean, the number of citizens who the only access they have to information is through that, what they're getting at the library. But it, I think just staying very specific would probably be the best thing, but it's a really hard sell. Tom, um, can I make one? Oh, sorry. Can I make one further comment on that? I, I'm not sure who mentioned getting, I think it was you, Tom, mentioned getting the people in the doors of the library. I mean, if you can get them to come and see what your library is going to be committing, which is not an easy thing to do right now, but I, I have, remember having someone come in for a, a photo shoot at our library downtown it just happened to be set up at, at 10 o'clock in the morning, which is when we open. And he's coming in and he looked at me, and there's a line of people down the sidewalk because they're waiting. And he says, what are these people doing here? He said, well, they're waiting for the library to open. They're coming in to use the computers and to you know, borrow books. And it was, you could tell it was a white ball moment. So, but I'm not going to suggest that's easy to do. <laughs> yeah, just uh, very quickly, uh, uh, local support. Well, my goal is always to have a not-for-profit organization that runs either uh, at budget or suddenly at the, in the black. And um, I've observed uh, libraries, I could men mention them, uh, outside of this county that have the same problem as we have in this county, and that is, is getting local support. And my observation is, it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort to get $2,000 from, a local, from a, a local entity. And if I could, I guess I will, I could ask everybody here to help with that. I sat down, we advised a, a library to the east of here, and they spent an inordinate amount of board time how are we going to approach such and such a township? How are we going to do this? And the amount of money they get is minuscule, but it's important that they get it. So if you and I and anybody else can help in that matter and mention to your local township and whatever else it is, he, he better on the divisions that I am, that the libraries are important. Uh, library, people in library land, as I learned from Linda, people in library land run libraries and they do a great amount of a great job they, and if we divert their time to mess around excuse me i shouldn't say mess around but if we divert their time he's reminding our speaker we divert their time to spend a lot of time trying to raise two thousand dollars since this is a township we're taking them away, away from what they should be doing is there a magic solution i don't know of a magic solution but jim it, that, that's a part of it though it's not just you raised some very good points about the, what the state should be doing it's the state, it's the county, but the local things is where I see, I call them time sinks. They get, they get a tremendous amount of time for a little bit of money. So all of us, including me, even including this guy, can be helpful at that level too. 
Excellent. Well, I'm cognizant of the time. It's 9 o'clock, and we do have some uh, audience questions, so I'm going to leave that up to you if you'd like to stay for another five minutes to hear what the audience has to say, or we can adjourn. Good to stay? Okay. All right, so the first question I have, um, I'm not sure who it's directed to, but how will Pennsylvania's proposed increase in minimum wage, uh, wage affect the operating expenditure, expenditures for the Cumberland County Library System? Do we have a sense of what that might, how, what the impact might be? I don't, have, I don't have a specific sense. I have a general sense. It's going to cost more money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very soon. I hate to be that uh, that direct, but uh, sure, it, uh, it's going to impact. I, I don't know. I don't know whether Joe now has a sense of this from a countywide perspective. It's clear that there will be uh, a number of our workers across the state. Uh, will be impacted by an increase in the minimum wage. So what that, what that adds up to in the final analysis, I don't really know. Uh, maybe we could get that where we're expecting it is. We could, you know, get in touch base with Joe now at some future point in an up in the future. I'll bet she'd have an answer for that. But uh, I don't know what it's going to be statewide, but it's clearly going to have an impact. Well, I don't have a specific answer, a dollar and cents answer, but I can tell you that the average wage for our CERC people for the vast majority of people who are employed in our libraries is about $7.83, mm -hmm. not much above what current minimum wage is. Okay. So, and I think they're talking about $10.25 or something, ten fifty. So you can do the math. I mean, it, it increases it by about a third mm -hmm. or so. Uh, so when you look at our staffing expenditures, and then that has a ripple effect because you don't want the person who's been there, who's the senior person who's making the $10.50 now <laughs> to be making the same thing that the entry level person is. So it, it will have a real impact, just as the child abuse laws are having a real impact on all of our operations. <coughs> Um, has the Cumberland County Library System looked at naming sponsorship of common items in the Cumberland County Libraries? Yes, Bonnie, do you want to talk to that? No, I think we all do that. You all do that currently. Okay, excellent. And then the last question is, uh, and this is directed to the commissioners, when um, the Cumberland County Commissioners meet with state representatives and or, or state senators, are we discussing library funding? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, that was the final question. That's a good Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> on that note, Thank you very much, um, everyone, for coming. They plan to come next time. We thank you. Appreciate it. Good evening.